Well, good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, host of Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the history and health of the Merrimack River. This week is Yankee Homecoming, and our guest is, has a lengthy connection to this week-long event. He is Norm Jutras. Norm, welcome to the program. Thank you, Dyke. Um, Yankee Homecoming is observing its 62nd year, and Norm, I think you're kind of the, uh, the historian for six decades of uh, goings-on. Can you talk a little about the beginning in the late 50s and, and what some of the people in Newburyport were looking for when they created Yankee Homecoming? Well, basically, the process of homecoming, Yankee Homecoming, was the idea of an artist called Jack Frost. And Jack Frost wanted to see all of New England become Yankee homecoming during the summer of 1958. So they uh, went around and tried to get communities to participate. And Newburyport, uh, the radio broadcaster here in town, uh, was the idea carrier. He brought it from the Cape up to uh, George Cashman here in Newburyport. And uh, they talked about it and got the thing started. So George Cashman ended up being the chairman uh, for that first year. And he was quite interested in getting the Coast Guard involved, was he not? Oh, very much so. As I say, one of the reporters from the Daily News had come up with a suggestion that Newburyport definitely should be the birthplace of the Coast Guard. So they did the history and the research and proved to the fact that the Coast Guard birthplace was here in Newburyport on August 4th, 1790. And one of the things that um, was brought out in the late 50s, uh, Newburyport was not, you know, the great place that it is today. I mean, there were junkyards downtown. A lot of people had left town for other places. And I believe one of the ideas was to get people to come back to appreciate the town and maybe put a little life into it. Uh, and the town certainly uh, improved, didn't it, Norm? Yes, and very much so. Uh, as a town, that was a beginning of getting things started. We did not even have docks on the waterfront mm -hmm. here in Newburyport, which was very sad in 1958. And with George promoting the birthplace of the Coast Guard, they were able to bring in the General Green, one of the Coast Guard cutters. Well, they had no place to dock it. So the Graff brothers, uh, mm -hmm. Henry Graff and his brother Bill, donated the construction of a dock on the waterfront so that the people could go aboard the General Green and tour and visit on that first year. You know, sometimes, uh, even today, uh, people in Newburyport are not aware that um, Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Um, as you mentioned, um, Alexander Hamilton and George Washington got together in about 1790 and had uh, revenue cutters built. And I think, you know, even today, uh, when people look back, uh, in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson uh, signed a proclamation that this is the birthplace. So, Norm, sometimes uh, it hasn't gotten across, but I do think this is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Yes, and that made it official when President Johnson signed the proclamation. And one of the assets of Yankee Homecoming is the volunteers. And I'm just wondering, what is it about Yankee Homecoming, Norm, that makes people interested? Because it takes scores of people to make it run, and, um, you know, there's so many events each day. What is it about the organization that uh, brings people? Well, it's just amazing. I think it's a love of Newburyport, love of Yankee Homecoming. But back in 1958, the whole thing got kicked off with 10 days right off the bat with all volunteers. And to this day, since 1958, none of the volunteers get paid. It is all a volunteer organization. And um, one of the things about... Um, recent events that I've been to. I went down to the river recently, since this is life along the Merrimack, and saw the kayaks and, and boarding race. And Norm, I did not see you up on top of a board, but I would say this is a great event that's come in in the last half dozen years. It really is. And not of that, this year the tide was going out as they were going out to race, so it made it even more difficult as far as the competition. So that's one of the reasons I didn't go. One of the things um, I thought about it was um, boarding, to me, is a tremendous exercise and takes great skill. 
and kayaking does as well. I was wondering, and this is just talk, it's not, I'm not part of anything, but I wonder if canoes, entrance of canoes would be interesting because you could get many canoers there and um, I'm just wondering if that's ever considered to uh, have canoes as part of this river race. It could very well be broadened into that direction or even others. It's just like the very first year it was going to be paddle boards and then it became paddle boards and kayaks and who knows what else will come along. Well this is Dyke Kendrickson and I'm the host of Life Along the Merrimack. I'm with Norm Jutris who uh, is the historian um, of Yankee Homecoming. And Norm, as you look over 60 years, what, what is the glue that's kept it together? Is it the volunteers or the camaraderie? Or um, how would you assess? Uh, because I wanted to point out um, that when this started 60 years ago, about 25 or 30 other communities um, in eastern Massachusetts had Yankee homecomings. And Newburyport is the last one to actually have it. And it's very vibrant, as most folks know. So what is the glue that makes it work, Norm? I think basically the volunteers, as I say, the initial start of the concept of having people coming home. And when it first started, you had all the volunteers, all the church groups had different functions. All the civic organizations had functions. So everybody was participating as a community. And I think that's the community glue that bonds it together. What have been some of the um, events over the years that, that you've enjoyed? One, one that I semi-enjoy, but they don't have anymore, is jousting on the mall. These young guys would get on canoes and they'd have these long poles with boxing gloves and they'd bash each other. Um, but the mall is very shallow and I event, uh, eventually they put that aside. But forgetting the jousting norm, uh, what are other events that have been popular over the years? Well, as you said, the canoe tilting was the big thing at the mail on Old Fashioned Sunday. And also they used to have a tug of war where mm, they'd have right. teams to, to compete. Uh, you had all kinds of other events at the mail for Old Fashioned Sunday, but it's almost like every day has something special for the family. You have the Children's Day, you have uh, all the concerts in the evening that have been additions. They're all new because we didn't have that many concerts in the old days. But one of the things um, it is popular is, of course, concerts. And every night they're down in the mall. And um, it's amazing to me, because I covered this for the Daily News for about a half dozen years. There'll be several thousand people in town every single night. And uh, essentially, there is no mayhem and no arrests. I mean, the last time I covered, there were no arrests during the entire week. And there must have been 50,000 people in town. So I think one of the uh, pleasant things about Yankee Homecoming is uh, it, you know, people are well behaved. Oh, it's amazing how people are well behaved. And all of that is everybody's participating in everything. Like they had the beer fest on Saturday night, and that was a mob at the same time. There was no arrests, there was no disruptions. Everything went nice and smooth. You know, some people in town have been here a long time. You know, when, when Yankee Homecoming comes around, they talk about the traffic. And there is traffic, uh, and downtown can be hard to get around in, although we do now have a, uh, a parking garage. But one of the things that um, I overlooked until I started covering it as a journalist was there's so many things for kids, little kids, you know, and sometimes we talk about, you know, that they spend too much time with their phones or too much time watching TV, but this is an event that the families can really get out to. Yes, there's a, a day in the park, and that was also the day at Mosley uh, Estate, and they do all kinds of extra things for the kids. Uh, the, the High Street Mile is tonight, uh, and hundreds if not thousands come to that. Um, has that been a popular event? In I think this is our first call-in guest, and I, I wish I could say, go right ahead and start talking. But we do not have that facility at the moment. Anyway, Norm, you're not running in the high street road race. I got that figured. But is this one of the more popular events? This has been one of the most popular events that's carried through. They have actually two races tonight. They have a five-mile race, a little shorter for the people that get short-winded and so forth. And then they have the 10-mile race, and that's the major event. That even qualifies 
qualifies at some of the national qualifications for the longevity. And it's hot. It's a hot night tonight. It should be you know 95 to 100. So you've got to be in shape to finish this one. Yes, you have to be in good shape. So I'm Dyke Hendrickson. Um, this is Life Alone the Merrimack. You're listening to Joppa Radio at 96.3 FM, WJOP LP, Newburyport. And I'm with um, Norm Jutras. We're talking about the history of um, Yankee Homecoming. Norm is the uh, self acclaimed or self appointed historian, but we need him uh, to talk about. Uh, Yankee Homecoming. Are there a couple years or a couple events that you remember, Norm, as as things that people reflect on? Like, well, back in you know '65 we had this, or then there was '85. Um, were there any events that you recall as being unique? Yeah, actually, almost every year there is something that's unique. But um, I'll brag about my own yes, year, 1975. Do. We had Ralph Ayers came to me and said, we sh- I'd like to do a reenactment of 1867 tightrope walk across the mall. <laughs> so we decided we would do that. I've and, seen pictures of that. Yeah, not, and, not from 1867, thank you, but I have heard. See, please, continue. Yeah, so we had to, I had a friend that ran the Skowhegan Fair up in Maine, so I called him and I said, you know, we need to find a tightrope walker. How would you go about that? So he made the contacts for us. We found the tightrope walker. The tightrope walker then told us he needed a cable one inch in diameter with X amount of strands of wire in it and so forth. And so now where do you go find something of that nature? So anyways, we chased around and we were given a source in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania rather, a wire manufacturer and we told them what we wanted to do and we wanted to do a reenactment. And uh, so they gave us the roll of cable for free. Wow. But what we didn't realize is when it arrived in town is how many tons it weighed. So fortunately, we had friends. We had Neil Weil that was with the power company at the time, was able to make arrangements for us to have the cable at the power company. And then uh, Dave Pritchard, who has the rental, uh, trailer rental place, uh, happened to have a truck with a winch. So we had on one side of the mall the winch from the cable com- from the wire company, and also the other one was from David Pritchard. When they started tying the cable to the trucks, the cable started pulling the trucks right. into the mall <laughs> just from the weight. So they had to t- stop and go put the trucks behind trees on both sides of the mall to anchor the trucks so they could start pulling. So then they started to pull, and we had some young lady on horseback come riding around the bottom of the mall caught the cable right across the chest and knocked her off the horse. But to this day, I still never found out who that young lady was. She just picked herself up and got out of town. <laughs> but, I mean, you don't see that much anymore, as the expression goes. But did, he, it, did the fellow get across okay? Yes, yeah. But the fellow performed very It was Eric the Great. He was a great performer, did a great job going across the mall back and forth. Uh, he was just a natural. And he, he must have had one of those large horizontal poles that they carry. Yes, like they always do, the yes. The and uh, that, that whole group. Well, that is certainly a wonderful memory. And I don't know that any can equal it, but uh, are there others that you would remember over the years as being... Well, we had things at the very beginning. We had a uh, Bobby uh, Bennett that was a chairman in 1965. They had... Uh race cars, little uh, small race cars that they were demonstrating. So what? Then they decided at the last minute they would have a race around the mall. Well, the police chief at that time did not like that idea. Mm-hmm. When he found out that they had done it, he came over and he said, you guys better not do this again or I'll lock you all up. <laughs> well, talking about animals, I think in the old days, wasn't, wasn't there, you know, chasing, it, chasing the grease pig? Did that ever happen? Yes, they had a competition between the police department and the fire department that they had to grab the grease piglets. And uh, they were small pigs, not a big, heavy pig, but uh, small piglets. But they were greased and so forth. But then by the time they get through with those events, all the notes that came into the newspaper and the press about the human uh, behavior with animals, that they should cut that out, so they cut it out. You know, there used to be uh, bonfires, as I understand it, and now there are fireworks. And, of course, the fireworks draws tens of thousands of people. I mean, that is one of the big events. When did you um, give up the bonfire in favor of um, fireworks? The bonfire, the last one I remember was in uh, 69 or 70. Uh, The bonfire, we 
Jack Murray used to be the, pep- the Pepsi-Cola distributor, and then we also had the Coca-Cola distributor here in town, and they would donate all the wooden crates, which some collectors today would love to have. But we went, I can remember going with Jack down to Lynn and picking up all the broken wooden crates from Pepsi, and we brought them up and put them on the bonfire. And the Public Works Department, during the course of the year, any storm broken trees and so forth would be cut up and they would be collected for the bonfire. During that year, uh, about midweek, uh, they would also used to saturate it with kerosene or yeah, gasoline uh-huh. in the meantime. Uh, somebody went down and lit the fire midweek, so it sort of <laughs> this disappointed everybody, but they were able to rebuild it and have it ready for Saturday night. Well, one of the great things about the uh, fireworks for me is I have a friend um, who lives, who actually has a condo above Leary's Spirits, which is right along Merrimack Street. So if and when I'm invited over there, you go out there, you sit on the porch, you're very close to the fireworks, and of course, if you ever run out of beer, you can just go downstairs or even drop a bucket down there and uh, get immediate attention. So the fireworks, there must be at least ten to 20,000 people watch the fireworks. Maybe more than that even, I, I would believe. But we have to thank Mike Roy. What happened is the first woman chairperson was Melba Davis, who was in 1980, and then as she left town, we didn't have a successor appointed at that time yet and so they were looking for somebody and Mike Roy stepped up and volunteered and one of the things he brought with him was the fireworks so then we've had fireworks ever since 1981. Now Mike Roy we're talking about is a former owner of Michael's Harborside. Correct Mike was a great guy. He was I mean I met him a number of times he passed away um, not long ago, but and he was a real force. And when you mentioned the fireworks, uh, as we know that so many people from Plum Island all the way up river um, in Amesbury, it, it's just a remarkable thing. It's very popular. Um, how about the slow bike race, Norm? Have you ever participated in the slow bike race? I think that's in front of City Hall. Yeah, that's a fairly new event. Uh, I, just a few years ago is when it started. But it's a great event because it's not who can go the fastest it's who can last the longest mm-hmm. yeah. and another one uh, that's that's held on a street i think it's federal street is the um the bed race and you know at first before i'd ever seen it i couldn't quite figure out um, you know how do they do the bed how do they put people on the bed i mean i must say that once you see it, it all becomes quite simple but that has got to be one of the high energy events because they have the firefighters they have police they have emts they have, you know, women's bake shops. They get a, a very large group of people. Yes, the hospital was involved in the very first <laughs> years of getting the thing started, and that's where the supposed to be a hospital bed, technically, oh, the I first see. time around. Uh-huh. And the JCs took over and ran the event while they were in existence. And so, therefore, as it is, has evolved, you now see all kinds of concoctions for beds. So this is Life Along the Merrimack. I am host Dyke Hendrickson. I'm with Norm Jutris, who is a historian of Yankee Homecoming. And Norm, how did you find your way um, to Newburyport? As I understand it, you're native of Lewiston, Maine. And um, talk a little about your life, how you came to Newburyport. And I believe, you know, you owned it for many years, utility store over in Salisbury. Maybe yeah. you can talk about that. Basically, I came to Newburyport as the general manager of the Grant City store, which people at this time would have known as the former Kmart that Port Plaza, mm-hmm. and at that time, uh, the very first year we got involved with homecoming. Everybody raved about homecoming, so we got involved the very first year with uh, homecoming events and so forth. And from there, it just grew. I had a family of seven children. I did not want to move and relocate anymore, so I bought out what was Bob Knight's Knight's TV and appliance uh, music store downtown. At that time, we called it Music Center, Mm -hmm. and then from there it grew into a warehouse, and now it's called Appliance Warehouse, and we have a store in Seabrook, New Hampshire, in South Portland, Maine. Oh, I see. I've never been to South Portland, but Seabrook, you know, it's certainly well appointed. Are are you still active there, Norm? Are you kind of emeritus at this point? I'm uh, sort of emeritus from the 
uh, uh, Yankee Homecoming as well as from the business. <laughs> Emeritus uh, with a capital E. Yeah, and the business, my, gra- my daughter Liz runs the Seabrook store and my son Jim runs the South Portland Main store. And it's really their business. You know, in terms of economic development, which we're kind of talking about here, um, Yankee Homecoming uh, did bring a lot of energy to the downtown. Uh, you must remember the downtown from the 60s and the 70s, Norm, uh, when we, you know, we just behind the Maritime Museum, for instance, there was a lot of rubble, it was a mess. Uh, what, what was the change of that? Was that federal money or good planning or maybe a little of both? I think we were blessed. We were very, very fortunate. We had George Lawler, who was chairman twice of mm-hmm. Yankee Homecoming, but he was the, sort of the catalyst to get urban renewals uh, changed from where it was going to where it went and then Byron Matthews became the mayor I believe in 68 uh, and he was the mayor for 10 years between him and Jack Bradshaw Jack was the chairman of the homecoming in 76 but they really steered the federal funds they went and chased all over but also I think the spirit of homecoming helped to be part of the spirit of the community or maybe urban renewal is part of the spirit of homecoming but it really has gone together real well and has made it a great community thanks to those people mm-hmm. you know i wanted to mention george lawler who, who passed away a couple of years ago and the story goes um that uh, when you mentioned that they changed direction at the time in the early 70s a lot of federal money um, was going to downtowns, and they, uh, you know, if, Ipswich and Gloucester were among those who just tore down old neighborhoods and old buildings, and you know, put up parking lots and new buildings. Newburyport, to its, to our uh, great gift, did not do that, and uh, they decided to put the federal money into preserving the um, buildings that we had in the housing. And George Lawler, as you said, was one of the people. Who, who was in a position of power and just would not sign that bill that would bring in the bulldozers. He said, let's keep what we have. And, and of course, um, Byron Matthews was as well. But George, I don't think, has received as much credit. But George said, I'm not signing this. Let's give it another try. Let's try to save what we have. And I think Newburyport benefited from that. Oh, yeah. Newburyport was very, very fortunate. The bulldozers had already started, and they had started tearing the buildings down. So half a dozen people stopped, and they sued the city, the state, the federal government. They stopped the HUD project that was going. But then they had to come in with a better plan. And that's where George Lawler got the NRA developed into a group that would be cohesive to make the thing happen. And it really has happened. Now, was your business affected? Um, where was it, say, in the early 70s? And was your business affected at this time? Well, in the early 70s, I was with W.T. Grant Company with Grant okay. City. Mm-hmm. I bought out Bob Knight in 1974. The week after I bought the store at 33 Pleasant Street, today it's the Commune oh, uh, yes. uh-huh. on Pleasant Street. And at that time, the bulldozers came down the street, <laughs> and that's where we ended up with the brick sidewalk. But that was the week after I had purchased uh, the building. So you must have been right in the middle of it in terms of watching it change and kind of saying, gee, I hope this works because uh, this is my store. Yes, uh, I was blessed in the sense that here I was, I was in the middle of things. We had Jonathan Woodman, Jack Bradshaw that were really running the show, Byron Matthews, a great city commission in those days that really went with the flow to make things happen. Well, both Jonathan Woodman and Jack Bradshaw were honored about a year ago. Um, They had plaques put downtown in the downtown, and it uh, mentioned their good work in those days. And Byron Matthews also has been honored. There's a a very large uh, monument to him, actually, near the Green Street parking lot. So it's nice to see that that some of these people, you know, are getting uh, some credit in future years and that um, they'll be remembered for what they did. Yes, and we're fortunate to be blessed with the opportunity to enjoy all of those facilities. And, you know, as you go into... Uh, we're about not even halfway into Yankee Homecoming. Well, what are some of the things that, that you've enjoyed, Norm? I mean, and I'm talking to Norm Jutris, who is, uh, has been involved for several decades in Yankee Homecoming. He's a historian for Yankee Homecoming. And so as you look back, what are you know, some of the things that you personally or your family have enjoyed during Yankee Homecoming? 
What happens is every event has something special for everybody. But I think Old Fashioned Sunday was one of the top agendas because it covered the whole families. Uh, and in addition to that is all the concerts that we now have downtown are just a real blessing considering that that land area back in, before Urban Renewal was just like as you mentioned before just rubble mm -hmm. we did not even have a dock down right. there on the waterfront that's remarkable yes well one thing that's happening this weekend and i mention it <clears throat> because i am involved in it it's coast guard saturday uh will take place the coast guard station and on water street will be open for youngsters to go get on the 47 footers there also at one o'clock at the maritime museum there's going to be a history of the Coast Guard in Newburyport. Uh, that's free. Uh, you can visit the museum for free. I am speaking at 1 o'clock and talking about some of the things that Norm talked about. This is the birthplace of um, the Coast Guard. It's been here for, since 1790. And I think it'll be a nice event if any folks want to come out to that. And again, they can tour the whole um, uh, museum at that time. And um, when, do, when Yankee Homecoming, uh, when does it actually wind up, Norm? I'm the parade is the wind up of Yankee Homecoming. And at the end of the parade, then we have an official ceremony taking the flag down, which is up at the Mall, which was raised on Sunday at, during Old Fashioned Sunday. Well, there are a lot of blue flags out there this year and indicating, you know, that is the flag of Yankee Homecoming. Is that something the, new? I'm seeing them all over the this place. This is wonderful. Jennifer... Uh, that is the chairperson of this year, went up and down and knocked at every door on High Street and gave them a brochure, a flyer, uh, suggesting that they would have flags available for them and it would be nice if we could get them to fly them all along High Street. So she, the other day, she had sold over 130 flags so far. Really? And it's just amazing. All over town is where they're showing up now. You know, another interesting addition um, to this period of time, I don't know if it's part of Yankee Homecoming per se, but is this feature, If This House Could Talk. And Jack Santos, who is a local historian, has encouraged people to write up a biography of their house and you put it outside. Um, like, the, you know, so-and-so, this house was built in 1790. Um, Caleb Cushing lived here for several years, then it was sold. I mean, it's very interesting to go house to house and, and read these biographies. It's wonderful. It's, a, it's an added addition that came up out of nowhere, it seemed, but uh, has grown. That I don't know how many houses they have now, but you go through the south end, you can walk from door to door, as you suggested, and just get that history. And another a historian in town, I had mentioned Jack Santos, Glee Woodworth um, has written several books about Newburyport, but she gives tours and lectures at this time, and she talks about um, different, well, she talks about everything. She's very knowledgeable. But one of the things that she mentions, and, and you brought this up earlier, Norm, and maybe you can touch on it, George Washington was actually in Newburyport. He made a special trip, and maybe you can talk a little about that. Yeah, well, he made the trip here to Newburyport after he had become president. So this was his first term, and we don't think of the presidency starting in 1789, because we think of 1775 and 1776 with mm -hmm. the revolution, but all those revolutionary people and the privateers, which were the boat people that were pirates, that were getting to the British and, and getting their ships, uh, were made a lot of them right here from Newburyport. So it made a big difference, and so when Washington came, he wanted to visit his friends, and that's how he ended up at the Nathaniel Tracy House, which today is the library. Well, you know, the Tracy family was very patriotic, and um, one of the uh, really startling things about the Tracy family, they were the largest ship owners here, um, and they contributed a lot of ships to the Revolutionary War cause. They had 110 ships going into the Revolutionary War, and they only had 20 at the end of the war. They lost 80% of their fleet. Now, as was pointed out, they did get some vessels as well, as you indicated, from privateering. But a lot of Newburyport people were very prominent, gave greatly during the Revolution, and that's probably one reason George Washington wanted to come up and say hello. Oh, yes, and again, they were friends, they were associates, and they were all involved in the revolution together. Yeah, so that was an exciting time, and, and Newburyport um, at that period of time was as prominent as um, 
a Salem or and uh, Boston even it was the largest shipbuilder in the colonies at that time we're a small community now because we didn't have the geography we didn't have the miles but we were small but mighty at that time I will tell you well this has been great Norm we're about up it for our time and um, you know just you have a final word like go out and see what you want to see this weekend Bailey, be part of it. Come and volunteer. You're enjoying it? Come on out and volunteer. We need volunteers for years to come. Okay, this is great. I'm Di Kendrickson, the host of Life Along the Merrimack. I've been talking to Norm Jutras, who is the historian of Yankee Homecoming. We've enjoyed a half hour. Norm, thank you very much for coming, and we'll talk with you again next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>